Swingin'. That's Rachid Tarha, Rock El Kasbah, taken from the 2004 album Takitra. 
street slang for tu es qui, toi? An informal way of asking, who do you think you are? The track itself has keyboards and backing vocals by our guest today, Brian Eno. I am Iggy Pop. This is The Confidential Show. And we're going to be chatting to Brian about his new album, Forever and Ever No More After the News. In the meantime, here from the 1973 album, For Your Pleasure, their second and final album to feature Eno, this is Roxy Music with Editions of You.
Brian Eno, Here Come the Warm Jets. That was the title track on his debut solo LP, recorded the same year, 1973, that he left Roxy Music. I bought it and listened to it with a friend in a squat and abandoned apartment house on uh, Sunset Boulevard in L.A. And uh, it was a beautiful thing how this high art and incredible melody uh, brightened up the empty, miserable room. According to Adam, Brian's grandfather, who was a postman, in whose house the young Eno first lived, mended organs as a hobby. And we're going to play someone who I think is a uh, genuine and worthy musical descendant of Brian Eno. She is fabulous, and she plays one of the world's hugest organs, and she's a huge talent. This is Anna von Hauswolf, Outside the Gate for Bruno.
announce a groove that was Harmonia with Watusi. They were a band that Brian saw live at Club Fabrique in Hamburg back in 1974, and that was the year that that was released. He went on to work with them a couple of years later, despite the band having technically disbanded due to a lack of interest and a lack of success. Well, here's Hedy One and Fred again. A Brian Eno remix of Told. That's what I was told, you know. That's what I was told, you know. Bloody flesh, that's the cold, you know. That's the work I feel like me to music I wrote. That's what I was told, you know. Family fresh, that's the cold, you know. That's the work I feel like me to music I wrote. Bloody fresh, that's the cold, you know. That's the work I feel like me to music I wrote. Just get lost. Lose yourself with Ezra Collective. Over the coming weeks, we are your guides as we set off together on a different kind of adventure. And we are very happy to join the fold. We've got music to move you and mixes that will whisk you away. We'll be bringing you eight hour long playlists of reflective music, all curated and mixed by ourselves to bring you to a state of tranquility and relaxation. And we're introducing you to some brilliant artists who are taking you on their own trip. Lose yourself with Ezra Collective. Listen now on BBC Sounds. Six music. Six music. We passed upon the stair. We spoke of was and when. Although I was not there He said I was his friend Which came as some surprise I spoke into 
his eyes Must have died alone A long, long time ago Oh no, not me I never lost control Your face to face With the man who sold the world Took his hand and made my way back home. I searched for form and land. For years and years I roamed. I gazed a gazeless stare at all the millions here. He must have died alone a long, long time ago. Who knows? Not me, we never lost control Your face to face with the man who sold David Bowie, and that is the very famous The Man Who Sold the World, mixed by Eno in what's called an Eno Live Mix. I'll be chatting with Brian Eno about his new album Forever and Ever No More, and his career of the last 50 or so years after the six music news. Sun. 
second single to be taken from his new album, Forever and Ever, No More, recorded in West London and Norfolk, of the track Eno said, my voice has changed, it's lowered, it's become a different personality I can sing from, I don't want to sing like a teenager, it can be melancholic, a bit regretful, um, Brian Eno's here with us, uh, Thanks for coming, Brian. Hi, nice to speak to you, Jim. All right. I'm sorry for the ever-descending voice, but it hasn't reached yours yet. Well, no, well, it's, <laughs> it's yeah, it's still up there ahead of me. <laughs> it's beautiful singing, and uh, I hear there's another vocalist on the track. That's my daughter. Oh, she's, it's really, really nice what she's singing. She's got such an interesting and original approach to singing. She doesn't consider herself primarily a singer, I guess, but she actually is a very good singer. When I first heard the song, if I could call it a song, the first thing I wondered about was, well, who are we and what are we letting in? And I don't understand all the words yet, probably because I'm a little deaf. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> surprise, no. Anyway, are some people just letting in the beauty of a natural world around them? Or would you be willing to talk about what's going on? Yeah, I think that interpretation is right, actually. All right. It's an idea of sort of surrendering, saying, let it happen to me. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it's going to be, let it happen to me. In this particular case, it sounds sort of like something quite nice that's going to happen, but... I hope there's enough in the track to suggest that it's possibly a little bit threatening as well. You know, that voice at the bottom, that's her voice slowed down, the one that goes, oh, that sound. Well, I wondered about that and some of the, you know, contemporary things that are going on. And then in the text of the larger, I've listened to the whole record and some of it gets a little darker, I would say, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So this is probably the least dark track. That's what I thought, too. This is yeah. the nice one. There's a sort of range of feelings in the record, and this is probably just about the most optimistic part of it. Ah. So if you're expecting more fun than that, buy another album. No, no, it's a <laughs> lot of fun to listen to. It's, it's beautiful music. Uh, I hear things going on with the time in some of the vocal parts. There's very specific. There's a kind of rhythm, da 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 da. And yet, when there's no vocal, the time is sort of like rolling by. Did mm. you? Uh, how did that happen? And how did you work up the time codes or whatever? I always started with all of these tracks by creating the sort of sonic world, just making a a world that seemed interesting to me and that I want to be inside of. Oh. And then I. Just just picked up a microphone and started singing. Oh, right. So there's there's no rhythm in most of the songs right. on this record. And there are very few chord changes. Often they stay in one place. And you as a songwriter will know that's a very different way of writing when you're not directed by the music so much. Yeah. And I thought of it kind of like when I was making my life in the Bush of Ghosts years and years ago. I was just laying found vocals onto musical landscapes and not trying particularly hard to tighten them up, you know, to make them connect to the landscape. I just thought they should be other elements, just like the wind or the rain in a landscape would be other elements. They're not synchronized necessarily to anything. They just happen. It came from within. It came from within, yeah. Fair enough. On a couple of tracks, I did a lot of reworking 
but most of the time it's a pretty straightforward and immediate approach to what happened when I plugged the mic in, got a nice sound on the vocal, so suddenly that's, that's a bit more interesting than just hearing my voice like I hear it every day. Suddenly I'm a different person in a different place and now I'll have an adventure. And yeah, yeah, you're free. Yeah, and yeah. in a way, you know, you would appreciate this. Sometimes it's much easier if you're not free when the music sort of directs you in terms of which key you're in and what rhythms you're going to sing in. Yeah. And I like working like that as well. But this was really lovely to have a canvas with a lot of tints already on it and just pointing up a few little things in it. I felt like I was just unearthing things that were already suggested in the music. Yeah, that's how it sounds. You went deep also, mm. you know. Adam tells me that you like a song I like very much. I've liked for a long time, The Duke of Earl by Gene Chandler. Oh, my gosh. Yes. All right, yeah. <laughs> and I loved it when I was, you know, I was a little pre, I think I was a preteen mm -hmm. or a young teen when that came out, and it just transported me. It's just a magical, everything about it, you know, wow. Do you remember when you first heard it or how it felt? I can remember so clearly the experience of this song. First of all, I don't know if you knew that I grew up in a part of England, east of England, Suffolk, where around the little town I lived in, which was 4,000 people at that time, there were about 17,000 GIs because oh. there were three big American air bases nearby because we were, the, we were the side of England that was facing Russia, if you see what I mean. Yes. <laughs> yes, sorry about that. <laughs> well... I have to say that it was a major factor in my musical education. Sure. Because in my little town, we had all these little coffee bars to cater for those soldiers and airmen. Yeah. And they all had jukeboxes full of American singles. Ah. So I was hearing a music there that nobody listening to the radio in England was hearing. Ah. You know, they were playing really kind of obscure doo-wop and southern R&B sorts of things. Because that's who was in the army. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, those guys. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Those were the people, that was their audience. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up loving this completely alien music. I had no idea who those people were, what they looked like, where they came from. There were no photographs of them for me to see. So I just heard this strange new music and I thought it was the most exotic thing you could imagine. The first record I ever really got obsessed with when I was, I think, seven or eight or maybe nine was some... Um, the Silhouettes Get a Job. Oh. You remember that one? Get a job. Do, 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 do. Oh, Get a no. job. Do, 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 do. Oh, Get a job. Do, 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 do. Oh, Get a job. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Dip, 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 Get a job. All right. Hey, pretty good. That's our first duet, do you realize? Yeah, yeah. All right. Only 40 years late our first duet yeah all right all right but yeah when that song came out and i thought my god that is i've never heard anything like that in my life yeah and then not long after that i think probably two years after that was duke of earl yeah which for a start for an english person is a very weird title because of course yeah it's yeah. like saying king of prince or yes yeah I baron understand. of count yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think he knew that, too, you know. He knew he was playing with the words in a way you weren't supposed to, you know. Yes. He didn't imagine that there was a Duke of Earl, but, wow, <laughs> Duke is cool and Earl is cool. That's and I'll right. put him together, yeah. And I'll have a nice car, and, like, you know, my girlfriend will have a mink stole, and, that you know, <laughs> things will be great. <laughs> That's right. That's behind that song, you know. Yeah. A, a dream of, oh, a lavish, wonderful life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. The royal feeling. You know? Yes, the royal feeling. And the great underpinning of the song. Duke, 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 Duke of Earl, Duke, Duke, Duke of Earl, Duke, Duke, Duke of Earl. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's unforgettable. All right, here he goes, here he comes, Gene Chandler, Duke of Earl. Duke, 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 Duke of Earl, Duke, Duke, Duke of Earl, Duke, Duke. As I walk through this world, nothing can stop a duke of and you, you are my girl, and no one can hurt you. 
Duchess of Earth, they all walk through my dukedom and a paradise we will share. Yes, I. Yeah, there's. Uh, sorry to jump right in. No, go ahead. There's a voice in that that I just love. The guy who's going. So it goes. Yeah, for so long. He just stays on that one note for such a long time. Yeah. It's, it's kind of has nothing to do with the song, but <laughs> that was really yeah, the hook for me. It's just this guy seems to have wandered into the studio and joined in. It's not a normal piece of writing either. The chant is yeah. the thing, the hook, and there's no tradition. It doesn't build to a chorus. There's a relaxed part, and then once he goes up high, it gets more and more tense, kind of, and mm -hmm. breaks like a wave, and you're back with the Duke of Earl again. And it's only, what? what is that, maybe two minutes, 20 seconds? Probably. It's a lot. A lot happens in a very little amount of time, and they get right in and get out, you know? My record collection at that time, I was buying singles then, and yeah. this was one of my favorites, but... I remember I had one single that was 1 minute 37 seconds long. It had everything you needed in a song. You know, it had intro, verse, chorus, a middle eight, or another verse. That was the task at the time. That's right. And it was a million seller, the thing. Yeah. The radio, you were told, when I was starting to try to make records in America, you were told absolutely not more than three minutes, mm -hmm. but better if it's two minutes or less. Yeah. They can fit it in with their commercials and their raps. And yeah, so yeah, that's right. So everybody tried really hard because they want to get that song on the radio and have everybody hear it. It's impossible. You know, so... Blah, blah, blah. I had one record. It had the name of the song. And, you know, they always printed the time on these. Yes, yes. And it's used to say such and such, two minutes, 41 seconds or whatever it was. This one said two minutes, 85 seconds. Oh, that's really good. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that clever? Yeah, that's really. I heard about people who would lie sometimes, but I never heard this one. That's really, really good. It's yeah. very clever, that, because yeah. you, you kind of think, oh, that's yeah, under three okay. minutes. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Two minutes and some seconds. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's really interesting. Well, um, I heard from Adam, I hadn't heard your cover of this, but uh, we're going to play uh, I'm Set Free by the Velvet Underground. And uh, Adam mentioned that that's your favorite. Uh, I loved that album, too, and we were listening to that with uh, James Williamson a lot, a lot, mm. before we went and did our record together, the uh, Raw Power record. And uh, there's all sorts of great writing on that. And great playing. I mean, for me, one of the other revelations of the... Velvet Underground was that they had a very mixed group in terms of talents. You know, there were some mm -hmm. people who were very good at what they played and others who were really quite primitive. And that actually was part of the sound, the mixture of... The two things sounded really good together, you know. Really and, good uh, together, yes. The simplicity next to the sophistication. John Cale's a perfect player. Everything he plays is really conservatory yep. quality, you know. And then you have Mo Tucker yeah, on the exactly. drum. Exactly. Or yeah. on the drum in many yeah, cases. The drum, yeah. <laughs> 
Were the Yule brothers unloaded, or is it the whole original group? Doug Yule was on it. Yeah. I don't know about the other Yule. Yeah, okay. There was a Yule. I seem to remember. In those days, you would study every single word, every image. <laughs> of that, the cover. Yeah, of yeah. the cover and the back cover and everything. What, what yeah. does it mean? What can I learn here, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because there was no... There was no system of rock criticism yet. You know, Rolling Mm -hmm. Stone had kind of just started. And I guess you had NME, or no, maybe you didn't yet. Not really then. We we had a Melody Maker, right? Melody Maker, Uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that was different. Which was at that time much more. Trad. Sort of, yes, trad and the organ of the music business, if you like. So at the time, it wasn't really what I wanted to read to find out what was going on in music. For instance, it wouldn't have. I'm pretty sure Melody Maker never had an article about the Velvet Underground during the 60s anyway. They may have caught up with them in the 70s, but not in the 60s. No, no. Well, all right. And there's a beautiful guitar solo on this. I just love listening to it because it doesn't sound like a real guitar player. But the yeah, yeah but the <laughs> actual the notes and the, the flow and the feel of it is real beautiful. So here it is. I'm set free. Closet mix. I've been set free. To the memories of yesterday's clouds I've been set free Free to 
kitchens, into your cars, into your homes, into your ears, and into your mind. This is Jam Supernova. Like that every show feels a little bit different, has a different kind of energy. Sometimes we are like, up, 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 and sometimes we're a little bit zen-like, I would say. Playing the best in jazz, house, broken beat, global club sounds, music for the dance floor. If it's new, if it's exciting, if it moves us, then I will play it. Location or genre is not a problem, but feel good vibes on a Saturday is what I want to provide. So don't say I don't treat you. Jam Supernova. Listen now on BBC Sounds. This is BBC Radio. Six Music. <laughs> yeah, it sounds a at the grabber right now. <laughs> well, that was from Adam. You know, I remember those guys. That was James Chance and the Contortions. Yeah. Dish it out. That was, whoa. <laughs> and uh, I heard they were always playing at the Mud Club. Yep, and that's right. Yeah, yeah. You know, for people who don't know, I would say roughly there was a time in New York in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, there was a lot of vacant space and uh, dangerous areas where strange people would uh, start some sort of a gathering or musical-themed area mm. with no business plan. And that was this guy. <laughs> yeah, Music without a business plan. Yeah, yeah, and he was, whoa, he was out there. And I, you'd see also their suicide. And I saw once he put on John Fahey there, and it was wow. wow. And uh, <laughs> I heard you tell uh, Rick Rubin, I listened to some of the podcasts that 
you did with him. And you said you just arrived one on a nice day in the 70s in New York City and ended up staying a few years. That's true. So yeah. I guess that's when you produced that. It was on an album called uh, No New York. No New York. Is that no wave or just you like the word no? Or? So the word no had come up because, you know, there had been new wave and there was this thing uh, in the air that this new phenomenon should be called no wave. Uh, I remember now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. So yeah. that involved, there were quite a few bands involved in that. And when I heard this scene that was really sizzling at the time yeah. I arrived in New York, yeah. there was so much going on in, as you said, <laughs> with no business plan. No. No, no. <laughs> things are always kind of exciting when there's no business plan. Yeah. I went to um, Chris Blackwell of Island Records and I said, this scene isn't going to last for very long. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to document it? Because ah. hardly anybody then had recorded anything. They, no. they were playing in small clubs, but nothing had been recorded. I think it's, this is still a good document of that time, actually. I, I was surprised hearing it just then because I didn't immediately recognize it. I thought, God, this sounds exciting. I was surprised how exciting and great it was. And did you have to encourage James and the Contortions to play like that? Did you sort Quite of say, okay, guys, come on. You know? <laughs> no, they no, were ready, right? They were completely ready. I did very little in terms of, you know, what a producer does there. I just said, play, and they did. So all credit due to them and very little due to me, I think. I remember one very funny, funny concert. At, I think it was the Polish Center in New York. That used to be a venue that yep. people would play. People found that you could rent this club, which was called the Polish Center, and it was for Polish people primarily, and you could rent it quite cheaply. So occasionally it would turn into this scene of utter mayhem in the most unlikely part of New York. Sure. And I can remember, I think it was Robert Christgau had written quite a critical article, comment about... Um, James Chance and the Contortions at another show. Be critical to. of them? Yes, very yeah, critical that's of him. them. Yeah. So there was this show, and he made the mistake of turning up at the show. <laughs> and J James Chance jumped off the stage, microphone still in hand, and started a fight with oh, Robert Christgau. my dream. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, got amplified. Oh. You could just hear this crowd of people all jumped on top of oh. the two sparring, you know, critic yeah. and musician. And you, all you could hear is... <laughs> yeah. Coming out, and the music still playing. It was pretty amazing. For people who don't know, uh, James Chance was a very skinny fellow who always dressed in an impeccable suit that was too tight. Yeah, and that's usually right. a really nice tie and a fantastic quaff, a la the history of R and B. The critic we've been talking about, Robert Christgau, uh, looks like kind of like the guy who wrote Trout Mask Replica. He has a large <laughs> walrus mustache, very long hair, and uh, really liked his food. So two different sorts of guys in that <laughs> in that altercation. It makes it a lot of fun. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I want to play something. This is just this has parts in it that are just as wild, maybe more wild yeah. than James Chance. And this is a. Uh, this is Nico, the studio recording of Innocent and Vain, mm. and uh, Adam notes Brian provides the rather unhinged synth <laughs> treatments that bookended the harmonium and vocal piece. And I, these are really, really amazing solos, and she's wonderful. This this album was produced by John Cale, yep. and she would write these pieces on the harmonium, a little, a small harmonium she yes, had. Yes, one of those little Indian, like yep. a shruti box. Yep. Yeah. And I had the great unforgettable privilege of she gave me a small concert in her room in the Chelsea Hotel once on the harmonium. How lovely. Oh, yeah, doing some of those songs. And Janitor of Lunacy was the big one that she played for me. But this one, Innocent and Vain, I hadn't known, and it's beautiful. And uh, the whole thing, wow. So here it is, Nico, Innocent and Vain, with my guest today, Brian Eno on synth. The secrets that I do not know I cannot understand 
That's really good. I haven't heard that for a long time. Well, yeah, I'm sorry about that. It's, no, it's, okay. it's very interesting to listen to it again. Sure. I mean, you worked with John a lot, obviously. Yep. But something that I think was very interesting about John Cale was, although he was a very skilled musician himself, he really wanted the first take, the surprising take. And I remember when I was working on those Nico albums with him, I would just sort of be setting things up and making funny noises. I was getting the synthesizer working and he'd say, great, that's it. Yeah. And that would be the take. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether he did that when he was producing you as well. He would try. Caught you unawares. Yeah, strange thing. It was more, he was perceptive about, he wanted something with some real feel to it. Yeah. And uh, he would use, a, with me, when we made the first album, uh, the group who, other than I was the only vocalist and the rest of the guys had instruments mm -hmm. and he would say well they just don't play the same unless you dance okay said, yeah yeah so the problem with that is they like to do take after take and all the takes are at least 10 minutes long and I got so tired and I got cuts on my knees and I bleeding and because I don't dance normally you know so that was his a really big contribution because it worked yes. they, there was something about those guys they were these midwestern guys who would just prefer can we just be the Rolling Stones now you know yeah, and yeah. what I did would always kind of embarrass 
trust them. So they'd be like looking at their instruments and once in a while stealing a glance at what this weird guy was doing. <laughs> that was that was my relationship with the Stooges. But, you know, I was like the weird guy who would also go out and try to get us a gig or something like that. Yep. And it did liven them up. So that was a <laughs> that was what he did there. Yeah, well, he was good at envelope pushing. Yeah. I think he wore a like an opera cape to the sessions most days. Did he? Yes, he did, and uh, it looked a lot like Z Man in the movie Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. <laughs> <laughs> and he would bring Nico with him a lot, and she would knit while we would. Film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the two of, now that's that's a really funny image. To yeah, me. <laughs> the two of them together was something else. But um, <laughs> yeah, he played viola on one beautifully. He plays beautifully, and he did the Marble Index with her. Too. Too. Yeah, and he also used a lot of. I, I felt like some of the effect of what you were doing on that cut was her, where she's coming from. These are very; those songs are based on very, very old German songs, stuff that's hundreds of years old. Right, that she kind of had somehow been exposed to a little bit, and just yes. it. She's not a researcher or anything, but it struck a chord, and she's she's playing stuff that I still feel on a different world someday her stuff is going to fit right in, mm -hmm. you know, because I just think it's really, really good. But it's, to most people in the world around us, there's something withdrawn about it in a way, you know, like it's not coming out to say, hey, listen to this, like me. Yeah, doesn't this feel good? There's none of that, yeah. you know. So in a way, you know, the, and there's something you and John did when you work with her that... <laughs> Like it dramatized the fact that what she's doing is really unsettling. Yes, very, very unsettling. Yes, I think. yes. And it misses out quite a lot of the sort of comfort factors of yep. music. It doesn't have a beat. Yeah, no. Know, that's <laughs> easy to follow or anything yeah. like that. And it's naked, yeah. just her slightly disconcertingly cold voice. Yeah. I mean, the voice is, well, I think that inspired hundreds of singers. Yeah. Her way of singing. You sure. Know, this, this sort of detachment and slightly slightly inhuman delivery mm -hmm. that she has yeah. yeah so very important we're gonna play uh, from uh, forever and ever no more garden of stars and you performed this last year in the see if i can get this right the roman theater odeon of herodus atticus that's right on the southwest slope of the acropolis Wow. In Athens, that's right. Did Roger play there with you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In fact, it was sort of equally split between his music and my music. Okay. So it was actually the first time we've ever performed together. Wow. <laughs> Although we, Why, we know boy, you started at the top, literally. <laughs> <laughs> the top of Western civilization. That's You're right. killing me. You know, I used to play the music machine. <laughs> you know? In fact, before this, oh. before this song, I made an announcement to say that here we are at probably the beginning of Western civilization, what we call Western civilization. And it had just that day, the temperature had reached 45 degrees. Oh, and the forests just outside Athens were on fire. We could see the smoke and the change of the color in the sky. And I said, and here we are at the place where Western civilization watching the beginning of the end of it. And I, I actually felt that at the time that we were at the, you know, the end of a long chapter of human history and something new was about to come along. Well, I hope something new comes along. <laughs> so, yeah. so do I, yes. Yeah. yes aren't, yeah. aren't we all waiting for that? Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, here it is, Garden of Stars. Oh. 
that we appear at all in all this rock and fire in all this gas and dust are we not each a flame all born to live in light all born to give our life how could it be how There is a real power in silence. In his first appearance for 15 years. There's a great joy in an artist surfacing after such an extended period of time. But all fears sleeps on his back. Marianne Hobbs presents David Sylvian. We have a very special audio diary recorded by David Sylvian. We'll be celebrating his incredible body of work with a very special show. The Spirit of David Sylvian with Marianne Hobbs. And if you would like to hear him speak, join us for our very special program. Thursday morning from 10.30.
was that? That was Les Demoiselles. You're on that recording. Am I? Yes, it's credited to Harmonia and Dino ah, 76. Yes, yes and okay. that, Yeah, that's Michael Roeder playing that so beautiful and flowing slide guitar, and it's very, very difficult to control a slide mm. in a way like that where you don't stop and start and take a little space to get it in the right spot again, and he just rolls along. You got anything to say about what you remember about that? Well, this was in 1976, I think, was yeah. it 75 or 76? And I'd already been pretty interested in German, what was going on in German music. Yep. I knew the band can and had spent quite a lot of time with them on their visits to England, particularly with Holger, the bass player. And then I went to a concert where I saw this other band, Harmonia, playing. I'd heard one of their records and really liked it. This, again, was music without a business plan. I shall use that phrase forever now, actually, <laughs> thanks to you. Sure. So I remember going into the studio with them. Well, it wasn't really a studio. It was just a room in a farmhouse that they had by this great big river called the Elbe, I think. The Elbe, I th yeah. I think it yeah, was the flows Elbe. up through Hamburg to the sea. Yeah, I think, I think that's yeah. the river that we were on. Anyway, I wrote the song Stuck by This River <laughs> in, that, oh, okay. in that place. And their studio was just a big open room with a kind of jumble of this funny equipment that you used to see in Germany. A lot of it had been ransacked from old radio stations and it was very high quality with no kind of friendly interface. There were just knobs with things written on them by hand, you know. Well, it was all yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. custom-made yeah. equipment that they were using. And, of course, the great producer, Connie Plank, was a big part of this. Did you ever meet Connie? I never met him, but I know about him in his famous mobile studio and all the can records. And That's right, yes. He was a really interesting guy. He was absolutely committed to the advancement of music wow. in a very sort of avant-garde 20th century way he would say things like this music is not progressive enough ah okay <laughs> and, right. okay well he'd be specific i'd say exactly this this is what i mean and yeah yep. wow that's right and you know there was no sort of cushioning of the criticisms he made of things this is old-fashioned mm. i won't tolerate this in my studio cool that sort of attitude <laughs> wow i i liked him a lot and, of course, then we had Rodelius, who was the much older than everybody else keyboard player. So when I worked with them, I was, what was I, 28 or something like that. Mm. But Rodelius was 40, I think, at that time. Oh, it's a or big deal 43 at that age. or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So this funny mixture of people, Dieter Mobius, who'd been sort of a performance artist, I think, a Dadaist of some kind, uh. Rodelius coming out of this long background of classical Austrian music and kind of yoga and meditation. Those were his sort of areas. Mm -hmm. Michael Rota, who was a great guitar player and obviously the clearestly musician-like person in the group. <laughs> yeah. And then myself, who was another non-musician with too much art school perhaps in them. I see. And we just sat there and started playing with very little prior discussion. We just thought we can do this. And we made our first record very, very quickly. That piece you just played came from a later album, which was sort of taken from a lot of the outtakes of the first lot of sessions. So they were things that nobody ever tried to get them right, you know. <laughs> the, it sounds so unprofessional. Yep, it, exactly. I, that's so beautiful. That's what makes so relaxing. And it just kind of flows along, I think, because of that, you know. Unprofessional is a big compliment these days. Yeah, that's what I meant, you know. Yeah, because it's very easy to make things that sound highly professional now. Yeah. You know, yeah there's know, all sorts of I software for that. I met Michael and did a concert. We did a number together, one of Noy's numbers, Hero in, oh, right. in Hamburg. And I spoke to him about being in Noy. And I get the feeling that by the time he was in Harmonia, it was sort of like he'd lived through Noy. Let's put it that way. He said, <laughs> he said it was very difficult and that Klaus, who he absolutely adores, yeah. but that he said that he was a difficult person. And uh, I'm sure, yeah, yes. So. Well, Klaus Dinger, I mean, was one of the great drummers. Yep. He played one beat, really. Yep, yep. Um, <laughs> That's all he needed. <laughs> yep. 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 Three kick drums, one snare, three kick. Yep. No. <laughs> yeah. so, but uh, maybe in a way everybody was, the people in Harmonia maybe were all refugees from some discipline or another, you know. Yes. You'd been, yes. In, a, you'd been in a capital R 
rock band or yep. a glam rock, pop rock, whatever. It's a rock band, you know. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, everybody had been somewhere. And wanted to get away from it in yes. many ways. Yes, and, and To go somewhere else. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It was made in the countryside, that, you know. So there was some countryside music. Mm-hmm. Well, here's something with a completely different feel. Adam tells me this is from the first soundtrack album you ever bought, or he's questioning that. Uh, I love this guy. It's Nino Rota. Oh, gosh, And yes. uh, Yeah, from the Fellini movie, Juliet of the Spirits. Oh, gosh, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Here's uh, Juliet's theme, Amore Pier Tutti. That's so nice to hear again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting, that album. You know, it's the soundtrack of the film Juliet of the Spirits, and there's only two tunes on the whole album, but they keep coming back in different reincarnations. Oh. So that same tune comes back another time as a very kind of melancholy sad tune but it's exactly the same tune just with a different orchestration he could do that he was so good at that yeah let's pick this up on the other side of the six music news bbc radio six music
That was lovely. What was that? That is Brian Eno, Unusual Temperament, no. taken from the 2018 soundtrack to the Gary Hustwit documentary of German industrial oh, designer yes. Dieter Rams. Rams, yes, yes. yes oh, uh, gosh, I'd forget. That's such a nice yeah. piece. I'm sorry to say this about no, my, it's my okay. own pieces. <laughs> I didn't listen that. I genuinely didn't yeah. realize. Dieter is closely associated with the consumer products company Braun, and I'm going to try this. The furniture company Witzow. Vitzo. Vitzo, yes. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, that's a beautiful piece. I uh, I enjoyed very much your album, Mixing Colors, with Roger. Oh, good. Uh, and, My brother, uh, yeah. played it a lot. And you had explained the process as uh, Roger plays pieces on a MIDI keyboard. Yep. I, I could go on and on, but I would only understand half of what I was saying. So basically, <laughs> I understood that instead of playing... Roger is a very special pianist. I've read Roger talking about how he works. He's very sensitive to the use of the pedals yep. and the dynamics of exactly how he hits the key. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of superfluous stuff going on, but then I guess he played those pieces on a MIDI keyboard, Yes, and then you made it sound a certain way. Yes, so just to explain to people who don't know what yeah. MIDI is, it stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Wow. So so what it does, it notices what you do on a keyboard. It records which keys you hit, obviously, how hard you hit them, how long you hold them down, and whether you use your pedals to sustain them or not. So it just records the mechanics of what you're playing. It doesn't record the sound. It records the mechanics. So once you have that recording, you can then apply that recording to any other keyboard 
that can understand that MIDI language, that language. which is every keyboard oh. now. So in the original, you might be hearing a Celeste sound, but then you can put it onto a group of tubers or a, a, you know, a toy musical instrument or something like that. So you can design the sound world after you've written the piece. So Roger would write the pieces and he would give me the MIDI files, which are just files of pure information. And I would then construct a sound world, you know, around his piece, as it were. It's hard to explain, but very easy to see once you see it being done. Hmm. And I think that's a really, really profitable, fruitful way of working, that there's so much to be done with that. So he would send me the MIDI files, and sometimes I would slow them down or speed them up. To change the note or the mode. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So I might change all the E's for F's, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. So it suddenly goes into a different kind of key, a uh, different mode. And then I'd send them back to him, and he'd say, oh, that's nice. That's, yeah. <laughs> Usually. <laughs> that eliminates a lot of the, you know, uh, I work with co-writers a lot, and generally the one guy has a piece of music, and then I come in and try to do a vocal. And each person in that exchange, you're usually, especially in the old days, in the old days, you were there in the room together. So part of you is like, Oh, I hope he doesn't screw up my bit. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. here you have the two personalities are free to interact without any of the attendant. Yes. Yeah, the attendant social overtones. Yes. So the advantage of that, I mean, the disadvantage, of course, is that you don't get the rapid exchange of ideas, which mm. sometimes lead you to somewhere new and interesting. But the big advantage is that you can spend a very long time on the little bit that you're doing. You don't feel like you've got somebody else sitting there drumming yeah, their yeah, fingers yes, while you're fiddling yes. around with the details of a sound, you know. Yes. And I really like that. I did most of these pieces on the train, actually, because I do a lot of traveling by train. I heard about that. I was going to ask you. The motion and the freedom from uh, being in one spot it must have helped you a lot to just get in there. So nice to, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so nice to be working on something and... You know, you look out of the window and you've got the English countryside to look yeah. at or whichever country I was in going past you. So suddenly it puts you into the mode of being a listener. You know, one of the problems with working on your own is that you're always in the in the mode of being the worker, uh, the person doing work. Yeah. So you're always in the frame of mind that says, what can I change? What can I add? Mm. Whereas really what you want to be is in the frame of mind which says... What do I need to add? Yeah, sure. What do I need to change? If you're a listener, you're much more likely to be in that second frame of mind. Sure. There's sort of different processes, the process of being the maker of something and being the listener to it. Wow. And I think one of the tricks you have to learn is some way of being able to shift between those two positions. I used to do it by going into another room and having the music piped through into the other room. Ah. So I couldn't fiddle about with it. I had to listen to it. Right. And Connie Plank had a brilliant idea. We were talking about harmonia earlier. When we were working with him then, he'd fixed up his Mercedes with a receiver and he had a little radio station, ah. that, you know, a little homemade one-man radio station that he broadcast from the studio. So we'd drive out into the forest near where he lived, and he'd put the radio on, and oh, it would be the piece of music we'd been working on that day, playing through the car system. And it was so interesting how that gave you a completely different perspective on the music. Sure. You'd think, okay, that's good up till there, there's something wrong there. Wow. But you couldn't go and fix it immediately, like you would do if you were sitting in the studio. You had to just live with it and say, okay, so that bit didn't seem to work, but then sometimes you'd think, actually, it does work. It works in the context of what follows it, you know. It just kept you from getting over fussy, I think, mm. and being more in the mode of, I'm just a listener, and here's this thing happening, and how do I feel about it? Yeah, and maybe putting it through an actual radio mm. to some sort of a transmission yes. might help as well, because as a listener in those days, especially you were normally listening to something on the radio, there's some sort of compression that happens, things like that. Yes. Music through a radio sounds different. It wouldn't have been the same, you know, people uh, for many years or now, they put it on their electronic device or on a CD and play it, take it out of the studio and play it in a car. That's not mm. the same. No, there was something about being away from the place you were familiar with yeah. the inside of the studio and being in this other listening place, the inside of a Mercedes Benz. Yeah. Really different experience. It was an important idea, I think. Oh, beautiful. Um, this is Roger Eno and Brian Eno, Blonde.
beautiful proper ending, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Instead of the lazy fade out that people like me. Yes. Instead. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, anyway, here from the new album "Forever and Ever No More" is Brian Eno. There were bells.
that is a very beautiful piece, and uh, especially at the end, uh, it's no joke. The um, <laughs> yeah. no, the lyric is just a really fine lyric. I'm not going to prattle and repeat it, but people will hear it. There's a beautiful. I was watching a video for that uh, that features the Acropolis and you. And is is that your brother on accordion? Yes, that is. Oh, got to play an accordion. He's a very good accordion. Oh, player. what a yeah. great yeah. instrument. Really yeah, great. Yeah. It's got such a kind of freight that comes with it. You mm-hmm. can't help but see sort of lonely sailors by yeah. in, in windswept harbors and so yeah. on. Yeah. Well, anyway, that was from forever and ever, no more. And uh, this has been a big deal for me. So uh, thanks for coming. Eh? Thank you so much, Jim. I've really enjoyed it. It's okay. been so nice. I haven't spoken to you for years, but nope. I'm so happy to speak to you again. All <laughs> right. Me too. Me too. All right. You take care. Eh? Yeah, you too. Okay. See you later. Bye bye. Bye bye. Dix Music. On an industrial estate on the outskirts of central London, close to Perryville Tube Station, there's an uncompromising former warehouse with a ridiculous amount of hidden treasure. The Collection, BBC Votes. As the BBC celebrates 100 years of broadcasting, I'm one of the lucky six music presenters given the keys to the vault. Over the next few weeks, join me, Afro Deutsche, along with Amy LeMay, Giles Peterson and Gideon Co. as we let loose on the BBC Archive Centre's more than half a million records in the company of our special musical guests. BBC Vaults. Available now on BBC Sounds. of Pnum, a track on the intended debut album by the German Cosmos Collective Can, a band Brian mentioned earlier as one he got to know personally during their visits to the UK back in the 1970s. This Moon Up mix is a succinct reworking by Eno himself provided for the aptly titled remix album Sacrilege, which came out on Mute Records in 1997. I'd like to thank my guests today, Brian Eno, for spending so much time with us and giving us an insight into his work and the work he's done with others over the years. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. His latest album, Forever and Ever No More, is out now on various formats. There's only one track I can leave you with. We touched upon this at the start of our conversation when talking about the music that opened our pre-teen minds. So here it is, the silhouettes. Get a job. Good.
combined. I'm gonna go back to the house. I hear the woman smile. Preacher and a 